All right. I, I'm guessing by the, the amount of buzz <laughs> that many of you thought of a story like that in your own life and, and shared it. And this morning, as we get into the next passage that we're going to look at in Luke, um, I was thinking because it's, it's going to be this thing that demands a response, a reaction from us. And, and most of us can probably not only recall a personal story like you were just sharing with each other, but probably a national event that did the same thing. It was something that many people, if not all of us as a nation, were focused in on, and then something happened that demanded a reaction and a response. And I, I thought of two of those things in my lifetime. Some of you won't remember these because you're not old enough, but for me, I can remember when I was about six years old, this was November 22nd, 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated in Texas. He had been elected. He was in his first term. He was immensely popular. He had been kind of a, a a novelty in some ways. I believe, if I remember correctly, he was the first Catholic that had been elected to be a president, and so there was a lot of talk about that. And he went, he was gearing up for his campaign for his second term to run for re-election, and he'd gone to Texas uh, to be at a rally, and then there was a long parade from the airport to where he was, and he was assassinated. And there wasn't live coverage. Uh, nobody in the news media thought it was going to be a huge deal. They you know, the rally was scheduled for coverage later on, but the parade, not so much. But there were thousands of people. It was just evident that a lot of people wanted to see President Kennedy and, and lined up. And then he was shot. And so this thing that was started out to be something good that people were watching and thought would be a, a happy occasion turned into a tragedy. Uh, another one for, for me, and I remember this one quite well, but I was teaching school in northern Michigan at the time, January 28th, 1986, the explosion of the Challenger space shuttle. Uh, a lot of people were watching that, even a lot of kids in school. It was during the day, but there was a teacher, a civilian, Christine McAuliffe, that was part of the crew as well. So everyone was watching because they thought, boy, this is going to be a historic event. And, of course, kids were tuned in all over the country because of the school teacher connection. And then just a few seconds into the launch, some of the parts malfunction, and it exploded. And this thing, again, that started out to be something everybody thought would be a great historic moment. It, it was historic, but not for the same reasons. It turned into this terrible tragedy. And both of those events um, demanded a response. Nobody watched either one of those. With President Kennedy, even though I was only six years old, um, I can remember that that footage afterwards was replayed over and over for the next several days. Then when the funeral uh, was held and, and all the procession and all that went with it for the funeral of a president, it was played on TV and, and I, th I believe we even had school off. School was closed for a couple days in mourning and tra of the tragedy that occurred. Both of those, and you can probably think of other things too, I just wanted to pick a couple that were pretty big deals in my life. They demanded a response. Nobody just watched those. Something happened. They, they, many people, of course, were horrified. There was a denunciation in both of those cases of the perpetrators. There was a response right away in the case of the Kennedy assassination. Immediate investigations and manhunts were going on looking for the perpetrator. There were people that were praised, the victims, both the crew, uh, President Kennedy, his wife. There was a Secret Service agent that went jumping into the car trying to protect the president and his wife when that happened. So there was... You know, all these different reactions. There were changes in policy. There were changes in perspective, changes in lifestyles, for even for some people, as a result of that, demanded a response. And today, we're going to be looking at another portion of the account of the life of Jesus. And as he completes the work that the Father has given him, some very significant things happen. And we're going to look at those, but I also want us to focus our attention on the different people mentioned in this short passage this morning so that we can evaluate their responses. I want us to see who we most identify with because we too are going to react to what we're reading here, what we see has happened with Jesus. And this is a pivotal event in all of human history, not just for us as a country or for a few people, but for all of human history. It's a pivotal event. So we're going to be reading in Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 56. Uh, if you have a, an app on your device and you want to be in the same uh, version, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV, so you can cue that up if you want to be in the same version. If you don't have an app 
and you don't have uh, your own hard copy of a Bible, you should be able to find a Bible under your seat or one close to you. And in those Bibles will be on page 884. Um, and if you don't have a, a hard copy Bible for yourself, please take that one. Or if it's a little, um, you know, beat up, pick another one that's better. <laughs> take it home with you. That's why they're there. We want you to have a copy of God's Word if you don't have one. We feel that's important for every person. And just to give us, to remind us, in case you weren't here the last few weeks, or, or just to remind us so that we're on the same page, running up to the passage that we're going to read, Jesus has been nailed to the cross and lifted up. And that's prophetic. Um, back when the people of Israel were being taken out of Egypt, there came, they, God was teaching them to trust Him, to rely on, on Him. And they, they were kind of slow, and of course they're a picture of us, <laughs> but they're kind of slow in learning that. And as they started out, um, they went along and they got to a place where they were grumbling, kind of mumbling against God, and God, they'd done this several times. So God allows a plague of poisonous snakes to infiltrate the, where they're staying, and when they bite people, they die. And of course, people start going, why is this happening? And eventually someone wised up and said, well, this is God's discipline because we're murmuring against him, because we're not trusting him, because we're not being obedient to him. And so they go to Moses, who's their leader, and says, please pray and ask God to do something about this. Moses does, he prays, and God says, okay, here's what I want you to do, Moses. I want you to hammer out a snake out of bronze metal, hang it on a pole, lift that up, put it on a tall pole, and then send messengers out through the camp and tell them to say, hey, if you're bitten by a snake, look at the snake that's lifted up on the pole, and if you do that, you'll live. Now, that didn't make any medical sense. There was no folk superstitions about that. It was merely an opportunity for God to say, listen, I'm not bound to your box on how things operate, and I want you to trust me. I can do whatever I want, and I'm going to provide a way of you to be saved from death with this thing that you think makes no sense, but it works because I'm God, and it when I say something, that's how it works. So trust me and look. And I'm sure there were people that said, that, that makes no sense. I'm not going to do that. That's stupid. But there were others that got bit and said, I'm going to look. I want to live. I don't want to die yet. And Jesus refers to this. He did that when Nicodemus, remember the guy that came to Jesus at night, the religious leader? He's talking to him and he said, just like the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so I'm going to have to be lifted up. And that's what's happening here. Jesus is lifted up on a cross. It's fulfilling prophecy. He's the completion of that picture that God instituted so many centuries before out there in the wilderness. So Jesus is nailed on a cross, lifted up. He's hung between two criminals. This is also a fulfillment of a prophetic statement by one of the old prophets, that he would die with the wicked. In Luke's account that we've been going through, Jesus has endured mocking from some of the people in the observing crowd. Some of the soldiers have joined in on that. Even one of the criminals next to him is making condescending comments to him. The other one, the one that's on the other side, um, he recognizes who Jesus is. Even if he started out kind of saying negative stuff, he realizes who Jesus is. He confesses his own sinfulness, his inability to do anything to save himself, and he throws himself at the mercy of the Savior who is beside him. And because God consistently provides for those who trust him, Jesus looks at this guy and he says, you know what? Your sins are forgiven. You're now reconciled to your Father, to your Creator, your Savior. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. He doesn't get a second chance, as Andy so clearly pointed out last week. But he gets forgiveness, salvation, eternal life based on his faith in Jesus. So that brings us up to the passage. So look at it with me, if you would. Luke 23, 44 through 56. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. 
This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and saw how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Okay, let's go back up here and look through this. First, I want us to look at the signs because there's some very interesting things that go on here that are mentioned by Luke that we need to be aware of and what their significance is. The first is the sun is darkened. And what reads in here that the time period is from noon till three. Isn't that the time when the sun is normally at its highest point? Most places, when it's at its most intense, when you most are aware of the sun's presence, noon to three. And so noon to three, the sun is blotted out. The sky is darkened. We don't know the extent because Scripture doesn't tell us if this was worldwide, if it was just in that area. It doesn't tell us how that was accomplished. It's unlikely that it was a, a eclipse because normally Passover, and that's the time period here, is held during a full moon. So it would be astronomically impossible for that to happen. Now, God can do whatever He wants, but just looking at the normal stuff, we don't know if it was this huge cloud bank or what happened. God has used darkness as a sign of His judgment, a sign of His wrath before. And so here it is, Jesus, the creator of light, the creator of all things, the the person who said, I am the light of the world. I I bring the light of life to all people. Here, his, his light, we could say, is being extinguished because he's paying the penalty for sin. And so creation, in, in a way, is sympathetic to that. It's darkened. Just light, light is absent. And it happens for three hours normally when that would not occur. That's, that's something that just in the creation itself, it kind of bears witness to what's going on here, this horrible tragedy. Also, the curtain of the temple is torn. Luke just puts a very simple statement here, but we need to understand what's going on when that temple curtain is torn. The temple and previously the tabernacle, God instituted that whole thing. He gave the design for that, and he he gave instructions for this whole system of worship so that he could be approached and people could come to him. And so the the temple proper in the tabernacle, there was... uh, four-walled building. It had a holy place. There was one room, the holy place, and then the most holy place. There was only one door into the holy place, and then to get to the most holy place, there was a curtain hung back there, and you had to go through that to get back there. And only one person could go in the, ho- the most holy place only one time of the year. The high priest could go in there one time a year, and it wasn't at Passover time. It was Yom Kippur, which uh, typically happens in the fall of the year. And he would go in there with a sacrifice for the people. And he had to go in there with great fear and trembling because if his attitude was wrong or if he didn't bring the right sacrifice and do the stuff he was supposed to do, he could die. And what was God doing with that picture there? There was symbolism all through. There's different pieces of furniture and all kinds of stuff that we're not going to get into today. But what was God, what was the big big view here of what's going on? God was reiterating, access to me is severely limited. Almost impossible. Only one person can come into this place where I'm saying my presence is in a special way, the most holy place. He can only do that once a year, and he better have a right attitude. (laughs) Not something, a delight. Not something that's relaxing. It's a lot of fear and trepidation. And so, here's this picture. Access to God is severely limited, almost impossible. And then when Jesus goes to the cross, as he dies, the temple curtain is torn. Now, there were several curtains in there, but I'm going to assume that probably this is referring to the the curtain that's between the holy place and the most holy place, because later on in in Hebrews, uh, the author of Hebrews gives that illustration to show Jesus is really the curtain, and when he died, then the way to God was opened up. Access was free and unlimited. You didn't have to go with fear and trembling anymore because of what Jesus did, and it compared his body to the veil over the most holy place. And this was torn. This is a busy time of year, Passover, so even though people wouldn't have been in there if it was the curtain between the holy place and the most holy place, there's still a lot of activity with the priest. This is something that couldn't be hid. It was torn from the top to the bottom. Bible, in the Scripture, we never have the, the actual thickness of the curtain, but 
rabbinical tradition says it was the thickness of a man's hand. That's a pretty significant piece of material, if that's true, if that's accurate. And there's a lot of sources that say that. Again, we don't have it in Scripture, so we don't know it for positive. It's ripped from the top to the bottom. This would not be normal. All these things pointing to what's going on here. This is the Creator, the Savior, the Promised One that is completing the work that the Father has given Him to do. And Jesus cries out with a loud voice. That's significant. He didn't mutter. He didn't murmur. He didn't groan. He cries out with a loud voice. Why does He do that? He's making sure that those that are around can hear Him and that He wants them to understand His trust in the Father has been complete right till the end of His life. He's lived a perfect life. He's always done what the Father wants Him to do and now He's finishing the work but His trust in Him is complete right up to the end. His work is complete. Actually, in John's account of of this, Jesus also says, it is finished. What's finished? The work. He's offered the single sacrifice for all time so that the whole temple system will no longer be valid. He says, the approach to God has opened up. I've paid the price. I've completely satisfied God's standard and his penalty for sin. I've opened up access to God so anyone can have a free and and without fear approach to the Creator, to the Father. So there's some of the signs that we see in this first section here. What are the reactions? We've got four different individuals or groups of people that are recorded here by Luke for us. So let's look at them. Be thinking as you you look at what Jesus has done, and I'm going to guess for most of us, this what happened here isn't brand new news. If it is, then you'll be reacting right now. But for most of us, we've probably heard this before as we're coming up on Easter. We've heard this story many times probably. But what what has been your reaction? What is your reaction? See if you, I think these four groups will probably fall into at least one or, or several of those. So what's the first one that's mentioned by Luke? The centurion. This is a Roman military officer. He's the guy that's in charge of this detail, what's going on here. What does he do when he sees Jesus die? when he sees some of these signs that are going on. He praises God. That's what Luke tells us. How does he do that? With an acknowledgement that Jesus is innocent. Now, in some of the other gospel accounts, he also makes a statement that this has to be somebody who's divine, the Son of God. He recognizes Jesus is more than just a man. So he doesn't, Luke has, focuses on this one aspect of what he says, but he makes a couple statements. He says, boy, this guy was innocent. He's God. There's something, he's more than a man. And he recognized that. Um, that's a good reaction, don't you think? That's a good reaction, for, especially for a Roman military officer who, he wasn't Jewish. I don't know what his familiarity with the Scriptures were, the Old Testament. But he, he notices, he goes, boy, just looking around at what's going on and seeing this guy, how he's interacted with the crowd who is mocking him, the guys on each side of him, the soldiers, the stuff that's going on, the physical signs. He says, this is something. This is something more than just a guy that's a victim of circumstances that got dragged in here because people didn't like him. Something else is going on. We don't know if it went any farther than that reaction for him because Scripture doesn't tell us his personal narrative. It just stops there. So we don't know. He might have gone on to do more things, but it doesn't tell us. It just stops there. Then the next group that's mentioned is the crowds. And Luke tells us specifically, they were assembled for the spectacle. They were there for the show. They thought this was going to be some great thing to see. Kind of an entertainment somewhat in that culture. Here's a guy who everybody said is causing trouble and, and, you know, stirring people up. And so they go to see him executed. And when they see it, they go, "Uh uh-oh, this show went bad. This didn't turn, we didn't get the satisfaction that we thought we were going to get from this. Something went wrong here. But their reaction is just a little bit more focused on self. All they, they just, they're sad and they go home. Ah, oh, that was disappointing. Oh, I think something was bad here. No indication that it really affected their everyday life from that point on. Just, ah, oh, hmm, I didn't get what I was hoping for. The next group that's mentioned is the acquaintances of Jesus and the women who followed him. And by, this is not a main point, but I want to bring this out to us so that we understand it. Um, on a side note, 
Why are the women mentioned? Luke makes sure that we understand that Jesus' acquaintances, his followers, weren't just men, but also women. And that was very big in this culture because women, it didn't make any difference. (laughs) This was not something that normally historians would note at that time. Who cared if there was women there or not? But Luke makes us makes it clear to us that women were also there. Jesus didn't just interact with men. He didn't just train men. He trained women too. And that was huge, very significant in that culture. But the acquaintances of Jesus, including the women that followed him, what was their reaction as they saw what was going on with Jesus? Again, it's kind of focused on self. They just distance themselves. They stand off at a distance and watch. They don't really act. They have a reaction, but it's to detach themselves, kind of look inwardly, hmm, this isn't what we thought was going to happen. Then finally, there's Joseph. Joseph, we're told here, is a member of the council, so likely the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious council. But Luke points out he was not in agreement with the decision. The trials that were had, the examinations, he was not on board. He said, no, this is wrong. He wasn't in agreement with the action, turning Jesus over to the Roman authorities to be executed. He disagreed with all that. But we also know from looking at the different gospel accounts, and Luke mentions it too, he was a secret follower of Jesus up to this point. He believed he was looking for God's kingdom. He was waiting for the promise of the Savior, the Messiah that would come. He thinks that Jesus is that person based on what he's seen, what he's observed, what he's heard. And so he's not in agreement with all the other guys that are on the council, but he's been fearful of what other people think because if he openly declares that he believes Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, it's likely going to have a cost on his reputation, his standing in the community, possibly whether he can be on the council or not. And we don't know, it doesn't give us a ton of detail, but most of the guys on the council were wealthy guys, they were influential, they were well-respected. And he sees what happens here, and he has a reaction, and it moves beyond just a, oh, this is not a good thing. And it moves beyond just a verbal declaration like the centurion, praising God. He, he goes and he says openly, he goes to the Roman governor. That's not something that the Sanhedrin normally, they didn't work real closely with the Roman authorities. <laughs> that was not the normal deal. And he goes and he begs for the body of Jesus. He says, if Jesus is who he says he is, and I believe he is... He goes, then he's not a victim of circumstances here. He's the hero of this story. He's coming to do what the Father has for him. And if I'm his follower and he's my king, I need to do whatever I can to show him the proper honor and respect. He says, so we don't want him thrown in a ditch. He goes, he goes to the Roman, straight to the Roman governor. It's no longer a secret. He says, this forces a response from me that must be open. If I'm going to follow Jesus, I need to be all in. He goes and begs for the body. Pilate gives it to him. He takes it down. He says, I'm going to put him in, a, in my own personal new tomb. And this, again, indicates he probably had some money. He says, we're going to put him here. Uh, other accounts tell us another guy joined him, Nicodemus, and brought some of the spices and stuff to prepare the body for burial. He acts it out. Everybody knows now that he's a follower of Jesus. Who wants to be associated with somebody who's just been executed? got to have some kind of a commitment, some, something that's motivating you beyond just kindness and, and, and pity in general. And so he moves and he acts on that. Why does he do this? Why does he have that kind of reaction? Because he understands what you and I need to understand, that Jesus is good news. Jesus does what you and I cannot do. He lived a sinless life. He had a persistent faith in his Father. He completed perfectly and totally the work that he was given to do. He is good news because he satisfies the requirements of the Father. His blood that was shed, his death there, because God said the penalty for sin is death. And he died that death. He did, if I would die to pay for my sin, it still wouldn't, I, I would be dead. I'd be separated from God forever. He says, I'm going to sub in for you. I'm going to be that substitute that was pictured all through the Old Testament and take your place. He did what you and I could not do. Jesus is good news because he gives us access to the Father's grace, unlimited and bold. 
we can come directly to the Father. Sometimes, and it's okay for us to ask other people to pray for us, but sometimes I know that Dan and Andy and myself and other guys that are pastors that I've known, people will come and they go, hey, can you, can you pray for me on this? Well, sure, we can. But, and I, not everyone that does that has this idea, but many people think, because you're a pastor, so it's going to have a little bit more you know, effect. No. <laughs> Glad to pray for you, but that if you're thinking, oh, yeah, you know, if you could say something, then God will really listen. No, nah, you're mistaken. <laughs> we're no, we're no more special than anybody else. Some of us, like in my case, God said, "You're pretty slow, so I'm going to put you where you have to study the Bible all the time because that's the only way you're going to get it." You know. <laughs> but Jesus is good news because He opens up that access to the Father's unlimited grace. And we can come boldly, no fear and trembling. He's good news because he does away with our need to continue the work. He said, it is finished. I'm not going to add to that. He is the one who makes the way open. He's the veil that was ripped apart illustrate, as an illustration so that access to the Father would be open now to all, not severely limited, if not impossible. In Romans 3, 19 through 25, it says this, We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, that the whole world may be held accountable to God. God didn't give the Old Testament law so that we could be right with Him. He said, I want you to show what my, I want you to see very detailed what my standard is, what my intent is, how you should live life. And when we look at that, we go, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make it. He goes, yeah, that's the purpose of this, that you won't have an excuse, that you won't come up with all these lame reasons why you didn't do what I told you to do. He says that every mouth may be stopped, the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, catch this, no human being will be justified or declared right with God in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested or shown to us apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, they wrote about this. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified, that is, declared righteous, reunited, reconciled with God by His grace as a gift through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation or a satisfaction of His standard, His penalty, by His blood to be received by faith. So, what now? What will you and I do with this? As we look at this, there's, we're going to have to react one way or another. It could be just self-focused grief and disappointment. You could walk away and go, boy, I'm sad. That wasn't right. That shouldn't have happened. This is a bad ending to what should have been a good story. Kind of like the crowds that assembled for the spectacle. Your reaction could be shock and detachment. I'm just going to distance myself from this. Boy, that wasn't good. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to stand here and and look. Kind of like Jesus' acquaintances, men and women. A reaction could be praising God through an acknowledgement of who Jesus is, like the centurion. That was, that was a great reaction. It wasn't resolved, it wasn't complete, but it, it was a great start. He says, hey, I'm, I'm looking at this and going, this is more than a man. This guy, was in, not only is he innocent, he's God. There's something more to this guy than what everybody else is thinking. And then the last one I think is the best reaction, Joseph. Not only does he respond and react, but he has positive action. To sh- that reflects who Jesus is to him. He says, this is my king. This is my savior. This is the Messiah. I'm going to do what needs to be done here to honor and respect him, to serve him, even in his death. And he takes him. Now, of course, it says there that Joseph and in other places, it tells us Nicodemus was there too. They prepared his body. The women went along too, again, culturally significant, and looked. And it was, they were in a rush I, I don't know. My own experience is the women went and they looked in and they said, oh, okay, we're going to have to come back, <laughs> you know, <laughs> finish this off. But they could have just been looking to see what, what are we going to need to finish this up 
after the Sabbath because they honored God. They wanted to rest, rest on the Sabbath, not do this kind of work. That's what the law said. So they're looking to see what are we going to need to bring back the day after the Sabbath when we come and finish this off and do everything right. But Joseph, his reaction isn't just a reaction emotionally. It's also positive action that his life starts to reflect who Jesus is. I think that's what God desires for you and I. He wants us to respond to this, what looks like a horrific event, in a positive way, understanding who Jesus is. In Romans 12, verse 1, it says this, and I, I'm saying this to all of us, including myself, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So here's the right response. When you understand who Jesus is, it doesn't pay him back, but it's that response like Joseph, my life should be reflecting who you are. And Paul tells us in Romans, that's, that's, nor that's reasonable. That's a good reaction, good response. In Hebrews 12, 1 through 4, it says this, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. See, he wasn't a victim here. He understood what this was going to accomplish. He was looking forward to the end result. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Jesus understood what was happening here. He just wasn't caught up in the events. He did this. This was part of the work to open up the way to God so that we could be reconciled, so that the penalty could be paid. Isn't that what the hero does? He sets aside his own safety and concerns and priorities for the benefit of others. Would you agree? That's what the hero does, isn't it? And usually it's got to be some, the, the more dangerous, the more risky the thing is, the bigger the hero is. So, as you think about this, and of course we're coming up to Easter next week, so we're going to have lots of time to ponder this. I have an assignment for you. It's in the supplemental notes if you have a copy of those. I think we might have them up on screen too. I would like you to, I want to encourage you to do this. Read through Luke 22 and 23. It'll remind you of what um, Jesus has gone through up to this point. And then next week as we look at his resurrection, the victory, <laughs> the celebration, it'll have a bigger impact on what's going on. Read through those. You could read chapter 22 on Monday, chapter 23 on Tuesday. And as you do that, think through and answer these questions. Who is Jesus? Don't give the Sunday school answer. Think it through for yourself. Who is Jesus? Is he good news for me? Why or why not? What is my reaction to Jesus? How will I respond to who he is? And then on Wednesday, you could read Romans 12.1, just one verse. We read that this morning. And as you read that, answer this. How will I praise God through my words this week? How will I praise God through my actions this week? And of course, Thursday and Friday, if you can join us, we're going to be having services in the evening at 6.30, and we can reflect more on what Jesus has done. And I want to also encourage it as a, the final part of your assignment, share what you've discovered from reading these two chapters and, and the single verse from Romans and the stuff you've been thinking about. Share it with at least one other person before next Sunday. Does that make sense? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your love to us. Um, as we look at what you've unfolded here, and we don't have every detail. Each one of the gospel writers focuses on different aspects, different things that are going on, different details, and we can put them together and get a more complete picture, but we realize even then we're missing some of what, what happened. We don't see every single conversation that went on, every single reaction or response. But as we've looked at this passage this morning, I pray for myself and each person that's here that um, as we react to that, we would see the value the benefit, the blessing of 
responding in the way that Joseph did, in a similar way that our life would reflect who Jesus really is. That we wouldn't just distance ourselves or, or go away sad, or even just be content with verbal declarations praising you, which is a good thing, but that we wouldn't stop there, that our lives would really reflect who you are to us, what you've done for us through Jesus and the life that you've given us, that access, that bold, free access that we have to our Creator, to our Father. Help us to live that out this, this week in everyday stuff, the, the contact we have with people that we work with, our neighbors, family, friends, whoever, Father, that we might just be a witness to who you are and who Jesus is. We're looking to you for that. We pray again, if there's somebody that's here this morning that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that they would answer those questions. They'd come up and talk to one of the elders or pastors uh, afterwards or anybody they know as a follower of Jesus to nail down their questions or to talk through that. Uh, As we have opportunity here in a little bit, Father, to um, take an offering, that we would just realize that's just a way for us to recognize who you are. You can operate however you want, but you give us the the joy of participating with you. And then as we hear, too, from the the report from the team that went down to Honduras uh, a few weeks back, Father, we might just see how you've worked there, too, and praise you for that. And we're looking to you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.